like most of us know you for your work on addiction and on mental health with a global pandem- pandemic and the uh, anxiety fear and dread that it engenders what have you observed so far and what do you, uh, applicable therapeutic information do you have for us well you know you're asking bigger questions than my brain is maybe ready to uh, to pro- uh, provide answers to but just today i was online with a group of uh, therapists that I'm training in my particular way of working. And uh, two of them, one from New York City and one from a First Nations community here in British Columbia, were saying that they're working with a highly traumatized population. And amongst them, the panic is just immense about this virus. And uh, they're asking, how can they work with this? And and the first thing to recognize is is when you're traumatized, um, your brain is affected by that. And particularly the, if you're traumatized early in childhood, uh, the fear center in the brain, the amygdala, is much more easily triggered. So that means that people experience things in, in different ways depending on how they were programmed in childhood. You know, the, the response isn't only to the actual facts and the actual um, realities of the spreading uh, pandemic, but it's also to people, it's a response to people's own subjectivity and the degree of fear that they're living with all their lives. And the more fear-oriented they were in the first place, the more likely they are to panic right now. And you really have to address that uh, and, and recognize that that partly what we're seeing here is a trauma response, uh, as, as well as, it, as we're seeing a genuine response to a real problem, but it's also, we're also seeing a trauma response. How, uh, uh, what kind of data is available on the impact of trauma in people's early lives and is it a uh, is there is it that um i want to say is it that a binary the response is it that people that have experienced trauma in early life are generally more fearful or is the opposite response possible a kind of numbness and dislocation well both can happen Uh, they're both um, either you get you can get a heightened fear response, or you can get a dissociative response, where you're not even in touch with your feelings. Um, on the neurobiological level, um, early trauma really changes the brain. Uh, at least it alters the normal trajectory of brain development in such ways that, for example, that, as I said, the fear center, the amygdala, is larger and is more easily activated. Um, and also when triggering events happen, like fear happens, the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that considers and makes decisions and makes choices and um, re- responds flexibly to situations, it kind of goes offline. So that we're actually functioning from their emotions rather than their, their, their thinking parts of their brain. Now, we see this in society all the time in all realms. I imagine it's being, uh, these days, uh, very generalized as a result of the not just the virus but also the how can I put this the virus has gone viral you know on, on social media not only is it a virus it's also gone viral and uh, the lancet which is a british medical journal as you know had an article about how to fight an infodemic so we're not just we don't just have an epidemic we have an infodemic and uh if i can quote this the uh the, the director general of the, of, of the World Health Organization actually said that we're not just fighting an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic. He said this in, uh, in the middle of February at a conference in, 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 in Germany. Wow, this is, there's nothing in living, like the living memory, like a global event of this nature, is there? Like it's for like 9-11, I mean, it's, it's difficult to sort of quantify because as you've said, like when I look at, I've never known anything so personal and so global, something that affects me on a personal level of, oh, how's this going to affect me financially? How's this going to affect my ability to travel? And then what's going to happen to all of society and the world and everywhere you go and everyone you talk to, if, you do, if you're not moving around, like who, what, they're all being impacted and affected. It seems like a unique event. And as you say, my personal fears are not, oh no, I might get this virus. They're much more, 
it's the infrastructure that uh, supports our society, which I've spent a long time saying is a construct and is conceptual and is based on sort of systems, beliefs and hierarchies that are sustained through our kind of through subjugation. The, the, they are now being shaken. And it's a, an interesting and um, I would say really frightening thing. Well, so, yes, all that. But let me put in some bro broader context here. So first of all, the kind of fears around disease that we're having now all over the world, a lot of people in the world have lived with them chronically. We just don't think of them because they because we're not threatened the same way as they are. Hmm. You know, like diarrhea kills tens and hundreds of thousands of kids every year, but not in the Western countries. So partly it's out of sight, out of mind, you know. So that's one thing we have to put into context is that even when you said 9-11, well, 9-11, that was a big shock to the United States because all of a sudden 3,000 people died in one shocking event, terrible event. But it's not such unusual mm, expect, uh, event in the lives of many people around the world, when we are bombed by the, the United States or Britain or wherever, whoever's bombing them, a lot more people have died, you know, but, but it's 9-11 that we remember because it happened in our, in our case, in the Western world, in, in, in North America. So partly it's, again, it's, it's when it happens to us, that's when we become aware of it, you know. So that's one thing I want to point out. The other thing I want to point out is, um, what if I said to you, that, that there was a preventable condition that kills 800,000 people in Europe every year, 15,000 in Canada, and about 8 million, a year, 8 million people around the world every year. What if I said to you there was such a condition? What would I would be your say to prevent it. Well, it, it's, uh, it's air pollution, okay? So, the, I mean, I've just given you the actual statistics. So, I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned about the virus. But but one of the lessons for me in this virus is how easy it is for easy how naturally easy it is for to recognize a threat when it's all of a sudden and it's strange. But in the meantime, we're ignoring chronic health issues that are killing millions of people in our societies every year. And what does that say about our culture? I think what it says is, as you've already explained, that it's outside out of mind if something doesn't penetrate our awareness or if we can operate without being impeded by it, we'll happily do so. But I also think that the sort of socio-economic impact of coronavirus has meant that whether or not you're affected medically or biologically by the condition, you are affected psychologically. Also, I think it's tapped into a deep and archetypal fear that we have that we are not in control of reality because we are not in control of reality. And I'm minded of the Osho quote of all things, uh, like, you know, what is what is society society is just a clearing in the forest and i feel like we we can suddenly feel oh no like you know not just in the in the sort of biological in the botanical world could the vines and plants reclaim us but in the microbiological world there are invisible forces that a weight that can be unloaded uh, weaponized at any moment and that we are for me personally even as a man dedicated to recovery and dedicated to personal awakening and participating in awakening however I can, I recognize, you know, to the personal experience of going to a supermarket and seeing empty shelves had a foreboding, like a sort of a visceral sense of foreboding that I didn't, I didn't anticipate, you know, I'm out here in a remote, relatively remote part of Australia and I'm fortunate enough to be with my family, but you know, to have the the uncertainty that we can, you know, we consistently live with uncertainty. As you have explained, we consistently live with disease. But the idea that our structures and systems are impermanent 
that they require sort of they they're faith based systems, economics and air travel. Even you know they're asking for bailouts for the airline companies in in the UK. You know all of these things are held together by faith and belief. And when that is shaken, our reality is shaken. Now when I look at this optimistically, I see it as a great opportunity for reordering. And you know the the level of uncertainty about how long this may endure means you know we're not talking three months, six months, nine months. Who knows when people will be able to freely travel, freely move if ever again. And but and. The, the thing that the silver lining is that potentially people will start to consider different ways of living that are more harmonious and connected to nature um but it, it, it's very interesting i suppose because i'm affected uh, like egoically as an individual like oh no when can i go back to england how do i go back to england how will this personally impact me and also what does this mean for the reordering of civilization um one thing that arose for me as you were speaking was a uh, um, something that a Buddhist teacher said once. Uh, what happened was that I was supposed to go and t- give a talk on addiction at this particular town here in British Columbia, but my airplane didn't make it. Uh, they had to turn it around because it's a mechanical issue. So there were 300 people waiting at this church hall for me to give this talk on addiction, but I didn't show up. But in the in the audience waiting for me to come was a Buddhist um, a monk. So they sort of recruited him to give a talk on a Buddhist view of addiction. And, uh, and so I got, a, I got a recording of the talk, and it was really great. And, uh, and but what he said was that in the West, we're always saying, panic, panic, everything is out of control. Where in the Buddhist uh, world, they say, relax, everything is out of control. Wow. So, so one of the teachings that maybe we could learn is precisely that whether you're Buddhist or not, just the idea of impermanence uh, and everything changes and we're not in control and how to be with whatever happens, how to be with the present moment regardless of what happens. I mean, that's what, that'd be a huge, like every, every crisis like this, as the Chinese say, a crisis is a combination of danger and opportunity, you know that. And, and so that in the crisis there's always danger, but there's always an opportunity. So like you, I'm actually wondering, Will this perhaps function as a teaching moment for a lot of humanity? I'm not that optimistic that it will, uh, it's, but it's certainly a possibility. It's certainly a potential, isn't it? And, yeah. and, and, and of course, the other thing is, um, doesn't it just clarify your values? Like, I'm, don't, 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 all of us, don't we all at this point realize what's really important in life? I mean, hasn't that been shocked into us by this? Um, pandemic, uh, that all of a sudden things that we thought were so important, mm, what is really important, you know? So it is a possible learning moment. question is, will we take that opportunity or not? And I think the system militates against us doing so. They'll want, to go, they'll want us to go back to our ordinary, narrow, individualistic um, disassociated isolated mode of thinking that's what that's how the system survives so whether or not we can transcend that we'll see in my optimism i imagine that uh that this if if you could see this through some kind of thermal lens you would see across the world a kind of stirring a, a global recognition of the principles you've described of oh what's important to me is the people i love community having access to amenities and resources and i live in a system that doesn't allow that or permit that and thinking about it I don't want to do my job and travel to all these places and do these things or are there, the only reason I'm doing these jobs is to participate in an economic system that will dispatch me very very quickly while propping up banks and airlines it you know there's no doubt that as you you know using the apposite Chinese definition that like opportunity is part of this. Gabor, I wondered often when speaking with you and listening to you, uh, what you and because of the brilliant um, essay you wrote that um, Martin Freeman read at the event I did at the Old Vic on the nature of, um, you know, sort of mental health, suicide and addiction, like that how your, what you can extrapolate from your work with individuals uh, what what from your work with individuals could be mapped onto sociological models in terms of disconnection, isolation, the impacts of trauma, and also the possibility of recovery? I know that's a big question, but you know we've got time. 
Mm -hmm. Well, look, I'd love to answer that question, but, but there's just a point I really would like to make, totally unrelated to what you just said. Oh, great. Why don't you just, why don't you just sing a song? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I'll come back to your question. Just, just to note something. So that in January, the, the World Health Organization asked uh, the donor countries for $675 million so that the agency could respond to the virus. Okay, they asked for $675 million in January. You know how much they received from all the wealthy countries? $54 million. Mm -hmm. So even in responding to this virus, what is our system doing, you know? Like we can't, even in the face of this, we're still being so, um, when I say we, I mean the, the, the people that make the decisions with, with our money, they're being so short-sighted, you know? So I, I know that's not what you asked me, but I just, I had that fact in front of me and I wanted to throw it in. It's You do what you like, Gabor Mate. I don't, when I do an interview with you, I don't imagine for a moment that I will be in charge of how it goes. Yes, it's like, it, it, even like when um, the, the rhetoric that's emerging from political leaders, uh, often indicates that as we have known the priority of the system is self-preservation and all else subsequent to that you know we naively assume or at least hope that these systems of governance exist in the most primitive form of social contract we exchange taxes in for protection for protection from the sovereign or from the state but we can see when cri the, in the revelation of crisis that what is g genuinely important is that the system is able to withstand the shock of this crisis. And yeah, and even as recently as January, when it was dislocated and in you know, non-Western countries, we were willing to go for the gamble of n not making substantial donations. Right. Now, to come back to your brilliant question of before. If you can remember it. Yeah, yeah, I remember it. Yeah. Um, so you, you're asking about working with traumatized people, addicted people. What can I extrapolate from that to social transformation, social dislocation, and so on? All right, you do remember it. Yeah. So the so the first thing is uh, that the two are not separate. So that that that, that the addiction and the I have a very brilliant friend, uh, Bruce Alexander, who's written. The second best book on addiction, uh, which is called, uh, uh, what's it called now? Oh, God. Good. I'm glad you've forgotten that. We'll look it up. What is it? Bruce Alexander, book on addiction. It, it's, 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 but it's about dislocation. Um, and it's, he's saying that addiction is a sign of um, social, dis not just a sign, it's an outcome. The glo it's called the globalization of addiction. A study in the poverty of the spirit. That's what it's called. Okay. And as I said, it's the second most important book ever written on addiction. And I say that with full modesty. You know, no, actually, <laughs> third, because I'm forgetting that you wrote one too. Ha 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 ha. You're very, very funny. You're very, very funny. Listen, I'll do the jokes. You do the therapy. I don't tell people how to run their life. Oh, no, I do tell people how to do that. I, I, got, I, I got my job description. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so Bruce is saying that addiction is a is a marker of social dislocation to start with. So he points out, for example, that the gin craze in, 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 in Britain, in England, in the 17th century happened as a result. There's always been drinking and drunkenness, but there wasn't alcoholism on a social scale until the in order to shuttle people into these satanic mills as um, Blake put it into the factories, they closed the commons and people were dislocated. They had to leave their homeland, they leave their homes, they had to leave their villages, they have to move into the cities. They dislocated them socially and economically. And that's what gave rise to the to the to the gin craze. So he said he makes the same argument globally, and we can see it. Like in China, where they've they've pushed people off the land into the cities in a couple of decades. Now they have a huge addiction problem. So that, that individual dislocation is a marker of social dislocation. 
so the, the one is not to be separated from the other. And then, but in terms of what we can learn from it, though, is that, um, well, what can we learn from it? What, what can I extrapolate from the personal to the social? It's, it's that, it's that when individuals learn the sources of their problem, and instead of being um, in denial about it, and and getting over the shame of acknowledging their own behavior and their own dysfunctions, and they learn that they didn't do this deliberately, but that this is a defensive, this is a protective, this is a pain relieving mechanism in their part, and not, and and, they, and if they open themselves humbly, as you talk about the twelve steps, um, they can actually transform. Well, th th that would also be true on a social level. What, what if as a society we actually admitted all our, our dysfunctions? What if we said this doesn't work, this doesn't work? What if we stop being in denial? I mean, somebody's written a book called uh, The Fourth Person, The Fourth Person Book on Addiction. It's called When Society is an Addict. When Society is an Addict. So what if we apply the same kind of thinking to the social level? Okay, what's really going on? Let's not do, let's not, let's not deny it anymore. Let's acknowledge that there's poverty, there's inequality, there's dislocation, there's discrimination, that there's oppression, there's prejudice against certain genders, certain colors of people, certain classes of people. What if we actually acknowledged all that as a society, and instead of shaming ourselves for it, we said, okay, well, how do we wish to move forward? So, and when you actually look at when revolutions happen, if you look at the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or an individual addict, it's when things get intolerable. At a certain point, things get intolerable. And then now I'm, I'm, I know that revolutions have a bad name because they've had some pretty um, negative outcomes in places, but that's just the nature of history. But the point is, they always happen when people finally get that something is intolerable and they can't keep on going in the old way anymore. Now, nobody can make that happen, but it's when, and I think from that point of view, um, what we've seen in Western society, certainly in the last four or five years, people are asking a lot more questions about the nature of this society, about the fundamental, fundamental assumptions of this society. And so this virus can also maybe contribute to that questioning. Like, 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 for example, when you look at the, the, vir the response to the virus, what was it? It was denial everywhere it was happening. Huh. In, China, in China, there was denial. Had there not been the denial in China, there might not have been a huge epidemic. When the doctors first spoke the truth about it, they were, they were shut down. They were, they were silenced. You know? And the same thing happened um, in Iran first. And uh, originally, although Koreans have done a lot better, but there was that initial response. So what if we stop being a society in denial? Even this viral outbreak would have been different. I don't know. Did I, did I pontificate enough on that one? <laughs> Could you end all of your announcements with that statement? <laughs>